Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I'm hoping at some point you guys just quote it. That's, that's my goal. This is, this is like memory verse time. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do all the good things he planned for us long ago. So we can do all the good things he planned for us long ago. What stops us from doing those things? What stops you? What stops me? What keeps us from being a part of God's watch this moment in this world today? What, what stops Jared Pavlou? I submit today that often the greatest obstacle to us doing what God has planned for us long ago is simply never recognizing our identity in Christ. Today I am preaching identity matters. Identity matters. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for this opportunity to be in your presence, for this opportunity to, 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 to give your word, and God, for us to hear your word. I pray that you'll anoint our ears to hear, God, that you'll anoint me, Lord Jesus, to speak what you have laid on my heart, God. I pray in the name of Jesus, let your will be done here today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Have you ever asked yourself the question, who am I? Who do I want my future self to be? Now, it may seem like a whimsical question, but, but it's a valid one. And, and it can be asked from many perspectives. We hear David ask this question multiple times in Scripture. Often, though, his perspective was one of thankfulness. In 2 Samuel 7 and 18, he says, then, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he prayed, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? In Psalms 8 and 4, he stated that same question. He said, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Who am I that you are mindful of me? It's an amazing posture to emulate from David. Who am I that you, the king of kings, the God of the universe, who am I that you are mindful of me, that you care for me? It's worth contemplation because that contemplation can only lead to thankfulness. I am grateful that God loves me so much that despite all that is going on in this world, despite the forces of darkness that attack the kingdom of God, he cares for me. He cares for you. He cares for our well-being. He has plans for us, plans for a future and a hope. It's a beautiful thing. And if you haven't contemplated that thought lately or, or even ever, can we take a moment today and grasp that concept? God cares for us. Tell your neighbor, God cares for you. Psalms 139 verse 1 uh, through 14 says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. He has time to be familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I, go, if, I make my, if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I wonder for a moment. I wonder in this room if we can express our gratitude for a God who cares for us. Can you express gratitude for a God who loves you, who watches over you? It's okay. Go ahead and give him praise in this place. A God who will never leave you nor forsake you. A God who knows every single aspect of our life. What an awesome God. As David said, who am I? That you are mindful of me. Let's bring that even to a depth. Let's bring it beyond ourselves. Who am I that you are mindful of my family? That you are mindful of the journey I am on. My struggles, my hurts, my pains, my joys, my accomplishments. Who am I that you are mindful of me? And as powerful as that question is in that context. Today I want to go about that question from a different perspective. Have you ever asked the question, who am I, as you contemplate your identity? As we contemplate how we think of ourselves. Personal identity has a, a simple definition, but the reality of our personal identity is far more complex. Personal identity is our concept of how we think of ourselves. Some of those factors we can control, like decisions in interest. I can control where I want to live. I can control where I go to school. I can control who my friends are, what I do for a living, who I want to date, and who I marry. Some of those factors I can control. Some of those factors, despite what society says, we can't control, and we shouldn't try to control. The family we are born into is in our choice. Our gender was chosen by God. It isn't our choice. Don't even get me started on the idea that we can choose pronouns. Don't even, oh, some of y'all getting worried. Getting a little, oh, pastor's starting to meddle. Nope, no meddling here. Everything I say, I can back up with the word of God. Everything I say. It's the word written by the king of kings. You know that one, the, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. That one, that's the one I can use to back my, my words up. If you have a problem with what I'm saying, I simply have one question. Whose word backs up what you believe? Man's word or God's word? That's my only question. You come to me with that answer and we'll have a good conversation about it. I'm not meddling. I'm not meddling. I'm just speaking the word of God. If I can't speak the word of God, who am I to call myself a preacher? I'm just saying. But the point is we all identify ourselves in different ways because of our many different perspectives and life experiences. And to take it a step further, we identify ourselves in different ways based on situations. I may identify myself as a son to Rick and Beverly Pavlou. I may identify myself as a father to Brenton, Ramsey, and Emery. I may identify myself as a husband to Jen. It's different identifications in different, in different situations. Different situations call for different identifying factors. And often some of these factors will change in different seasons of your life. For example, for many years, if someone would, a, would have asked me what I do for a living, I would have said, I am a network engineer. Even, even after I began to do ministry and even pulpit ministry, my identity in my own head was still rooted into the identity of I am an engineer. But as time progressed, as my ministry has progressed, I begin to identify more as a minister than an engineer. And now if you were to ask me who I am, I will say I am the pastor of Point Church. I am a preacher, a pastor. Seasons have changed how I identify myself. But no matter what season or situation you find yourself in today, I have come to tell you identity matters. It matters. Knowing who you are is vital to operating in your giftedness and doing what you're called to do. If you're struggling with your identity, you will struggle with your calling. That's all there is to it. Now, I'm not saying in each season of life you are supposed to immediately have a grasp on who you are. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it comes easy. As, as a, ask a father or mother who just had a kid yesterday or, or, or last week or for that matter last month if they have a strong grasp on their identity as a parent. For that matter, ask any parent in any time frame of their life 
if they have a firm grasp on their identity as a parent. I think your answer is gonna, you're going to find as, no, have no idea what I'm doing. Been doing this for, for 15 years now. Have no clue what I'm doing every day. Doesn't matter how many YouTube videos you watch, how many books you read, getting a grasp on the identity of parenthood takes some time. And often just when you think you do have a grasp on the identity of parenthood, something comes along to show you how little you really understood your grasp. And and there's other examples. I'll give you a personal example. For me to properly identify as a pastor, I had to develop confidence in my calling. And because of my life experience, and you know my, my journey, I was 27 years old before I started moving into ministry in my life. And my, so my journey was different. My personality, it took some time for me to, 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 to start walking into this. And I'll never forget as I was kind of early on in my journey and in, in moving into more pastoral roles, I, I'll never forget my dad telling me one day, I was explaining my lack of sureness with certain tasks that a pastor is expected to be able to do naturally. And he said, son, it just takes a while to get comfortable in your own skin. And he was so right. It took time for me to become comfortable with certain aspects of being a pastor. To, to be the first call in a crisis took, took some time to get used to. To, to walk into hospital rooms in, 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 in crazy situations that may be going on in a family's life took time for me to get used to. And I don't know if I'll ever get used to it. Funerals took time. Weddings take time. You think it's easy. Folks, it's not easy. You think it is. You come right on up here next wedding next funeral yours just saying as as quickest way to make you respect a, a position is you get yourself in that position once or twice whole different world but I had to become comfortable in who I was for me to become effective and I'm so thankful for a merciful God and a strong team as I've worked and still work to grow in these areas. The truth is, you can tell when someone isn't comfortable with their identity. When someone is unsure of who they are, it shows in their actions and it shows in their speech and it shows in their mannerisms. People can see when you're not comfortable with who you are. And it's the breeding ground for insecurities. It's the home place of fear. And sooner or later, no matter how hard you try to hide your insecurities, your fear, your identity crisis moments, people will notice and their response to you will be based on their comprehension of your identity. For example, if I was going to be going on a plane flight tomorrow and I walked up to a man wearing a pilot's uniform with four stripes on their shoulder designating he's the captain, and I were to say, so you're our pilot today? I'm expecting a resounding and hearty yes. Because if that cat seems confused, starts him hawing around, well, I guess I am. I think I do piloting stuff. I think I know what to do. I think I can fly this way. I'm not getting on that flight, folks. <laughs> Just not going to do it. Jerry David Pablo ain't going with him. Because his identity crisis is causing me concern. I no longer trust him. And in like manner, another example would be if I'm about to take a trek through the frontier, and I get to pick my guide on that frontier. I'm going to be picking, I'm looking for the roughest, toughest, most outdoorsman individual I can find. I want the guy to have machetes all over the place. I want him to have an axe right there. I, I want him to have knives and guns galore. I want him to have a load of confidence. I'll probably say something like this to all the guys. Which one of you is the greatest frontier guide who has ever lived? And the first one to raise his hand, I'm probably picking that person. Because that person is sure about their identity, their calling, and their abilities. Having a firm foundation of who you are matters. Identity matters. So the question I have today is, why is it that so often people struggle with their identity? Why? A man by the name of Eric Erickson was born in 1902. He was a German-American developmental psychologist who became most famous for his theory of psychological development in human beings. And he coined the phrase that we all so often will use without even knowing where it came from, identity crisis. He's the guy who, who coined that phrase. Erickson theorized that our life cycle is divided into eight stages, each containing a conflict. And he believed that the resolution of each of those conflicts in our development was the catalyst leading to the development of certain parts of our personality. That sounds complex. You're like, couldn't even write it all down. But to give context, most use his theories in understanding how a child develops through, from adolescence into an adult. 
The resolution of conflicts in a child's life helped develop personality traits. Or as Calvin and Hobbes' dad always said in the Calvin and Hobbes comics, conflicts build character. Build character. There's a pic they're going to put up there right there. This is one of my favorite comics in all the world. Calvin, go do something you hate. Being miserable builds character. When I was young, I always saw this from Calvin's perspective. So, so we're supposed to be building character in all these trials of life. Now I see it more from the dad's perspective. Yes, go take out the trash. It builds character, Brenton. Go take out the trash. It, it just changes. It changes your perspective as you get older. It, it does. But what I find extremely interesting in this concept of identity crisis is this. They have found that identity crisis is not even close to being only applicable to kids and adolescents. Identity crisis can happen during any major change of your life. Taking on a new role in your job can trigger identity crisis. Becoming a parent, going through a divorce, going into retirement, death of a loved one, all of these major changes in our lives can trigger conflict and identity crisis. And, and when you enter into a period of identity crisis, and I think what I'm trying to get at is we all struggle with our identity at times. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. It presents itself as a period of uncertainty in your life. You begin to feel insecure and even, even unstable at times. And, and often people can become depressed during an identity crisis. But regardless of the many symptoms you face in an identity crisis, perhaps the greatest symptom of identity crisis is your loss of effectiveness. When you are struggling with who you are, you rarely ever do what you were created to do. Loss of identity equals loss of effectiveness. Listen to this closely. What you do flows directly from who you are. We live from our identity, not for our identity. If you're living for your identity, you're doing it wrong. If you find yourself saying, I can't do that, well, because I'm a Christian. Or I can't say that because I'm a child of God. There's a good chance you're living for your identity instead of from your identity. See, when you live from your identity, it's different because I am a Christian. I won't do that. Because I am a child of God, I won't say things like that. It's a different perspective. I know it sounds the same, but it's a different perspective when you live from who you are. We must live from our identity. You'll compromise when you're living for your identity. You'll never compromise when you're living from your identity. I'm just saying... I'm just saying, we got to get it right in our lives. We must live from our identity. And that's why our identity matters. And that's why the enemy attacks our identity with everything he has. I want to remind you of the fall of Lucifer. Tradition says that Ezekiel 28 is describing who Lucifer was. Ezekiel 28, 14 says, I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stories of fire, stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Lucifer was created by God to be a mighty angelic guardian. He was ordained and anointed with purpose. I need you to hear that. He had purpose. In fact, verse 13 hints at this purpose. In verse 20, uh, chapter 28, verse 13, it says, The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Tradition holds that Lucifer was perhaps the chief musician in heaven. Created with pipes and timbrels for the single purpose of worshiping the one true God. The truth is, and, and if we want to get into the, the biblical concept and scholars, scholars here, Scripture does not say with clarity his exact duties in heaven, nor does it say with any, give you any deeper connection than those, I don't know, 15 words I read there, that, 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 that Lucifer was the chief musician. That's the furthest it goes. Whether he was the chief musician or not is not the point. We know he was ordained and anointed as a mighty angelic guardian, and he had a purpose in heaven. And then we read about his fall in Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning. 
How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Listen to me today. The fall of Lucifer started when he lost his identity. He was created to be a guardian in heaven. But instead, he decided, he decided to exalt himself above that which he was guarding. Perhaps he had the first identity crisis ever before Eric Erickson ever even invented the term. But either way, when he lost his identity, he lost his purpose. And without purpose, he was no longer effective in his calling. Our identity matters. And with this knowledge of who Satan is, there shouldn't be any surprise to learn that Satan, the great deceiver, the one who fell from heaven, uses the same tactic against the people of God. He declares war on our identity every day. Listen to me. He declares war on who you are every day. He knows from personal experience it is the surest way to wreck the relationship between us and God. He's seen it with his own eyes. And I'm going to go there for just a moment, okay? The attack on our identity has become a full court press in this world. He doesn't just attack you personally. He attacks through avenues that affect the identity of the masses. The, the enemy has attacked everything that you can imagine that is godly. He has attacked the identity of marriage. Mark 10, 6 through 9 says, But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. There was no confusion. God created them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man must leave his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united as one, male and female. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. It was, an or, it was ordained by God for the marriage between, to be between a man and a woman. And the enemy knows... That the identity of marriage is a big part of the plan of God. He knows that the Bible is full of illustrations of a husband loving his wife and the wife loving her husband that as God loves the church. He, he, he knows that there's so much into that, that idea. So he attacks the identity of marriage to bring confusion into this world. He attacks the identity of a man. He attacks the identity of a woman. He tries to normalize things that are contrary to the way God created them. It's a full course press against the things of God. It's called pastoring. <laughs> if he can make it normal that a man doesn't have to identify as a man or a woman doesn't have to identify as a woman, he will introduce confusion that helps his battle against the kingdom of God. And, and I, want you to, I want you to know this beyond this. He doesn't care your identification. All he cares about is destroying the kingdom of God. It ain't about you. It's about him and his attack against the things of God. That's all he cares about. And he'll confuse you in every way possible to try to attack the kingdom of God. He'll try to distort marriage, make it not make sense. Because if it doesn't make sense to the person, then the scriptural references can't make sense. It's an attack to destroy the kingdom of God. And the enemy doesn't just stop here with attacks, though. He will attack the identity of families. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you. And you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. But the enemy is on a full court press against our children. There is a constant push from society to teach our children things without the parents' involvement. A push for privacy and, and choice among young people who don't yet have an understanding of the dangers of this world. Society is trying to drive a wedge between the dynamic of the parent and the child. There is a reason the Bible says children obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. There's a reason. Your parents have been through some things. They've been through the attack on the enemy. They have overcome some things in this world. And no one in this world but God loves you like your parents love you. They're there to help you. They're there to, be, to, to, to get you through some things. Their rules are there to protect you. 
So the enemy knows this and he attacks this concept with everything he can. If the enemy can disrupt the family, if Satan can, can cause the identity of the family to be corrupted, it's a tactic to destroy the kingdom of God. And that's what he's after. He don't care about your family. He cares about destroying the kingdom of God. And he'll use your family to do it every single time. I'm preaching today, our identity matters. Identity. Don't let the enemy attack your identity. Perhaps the greatest danger of all, though, is when we allow others to define our identity. See, I want to show you something in the scripture. In 1 Samuel 17, the Philistines have come out to go to war against the Israelites. The Bible says Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. And then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and, and as thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield and then Goliath stood and shouted out this taunt against the Israelites why are you all coming out to fight I am the Philistine champion but you're nothing but servants of Saul choose one man to come down here and fight me if he kills me then we will be your slaves if I kill him then you will be our slaves I defy the armies of Israel today send me a man who will fight me when Saul and the Israelites heard this they were terrified and deeply shaken and I submit to you today, the reason the children of Israel were too afraid to take on Goliath is because they allowed Goliath to define their identity. Goliath defined his own identity as the Philistine champion, but he defined them as just servants of Saul. Listen to me today. No, they were not just servants of Saul. They were children of the Most High God. They served the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had the one true God on their side, but they allowed an enemy to define who they were. You were only servants of Saul. And because they lost their identity, they became too afraid to fight. I wonder how many people in this room have allowed the enemy in their life to define their identity. Standing on the outskirts of a battle, they're sure to win, but too afraid to walk into the valley to take on the giant. All because they allowed their identity to be stolen. Now, many of you have read the story of David and Goliath. For 40 days, this Philistine shouted insults to the children of Israel, defining who they were for 40 days. And then David arrives from the fields with food for his brothers, and, and he asks the right question right away. 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? He didn't say, who am I? He said, who is that? Who is that thing? Who is this person spitting lies to the people of God? Who is this person defying the armies of the living God? Many of you know the story. David goes before Saul. After a bit of argument and reasoning, Saul allows David to go down into the valley to fight the giant. 1 Samuel 17, 41, Goliath walked out towards David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. But David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then he sets it all straight. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people. 
his people. The Lord rescues his people. When you're a child of God, the Lord rescues his people. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. David understood his identity, church. See, he had figured it out in those conflicts in the wilderness with the lion and the bear because conflicts developed the character. He had figured it out walking with the sheep, praising and worshiping the one true God. He wasn't confused about who he was. He was a child of God. His identity was sure. And he countered the lies of the Philistine with that simple statement. I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. Today, the Lord will conquer this battle. What I'm trying to show you here this morning is when your identity is secure... You can face the giant with confidence. Identity matters. So who are you, church? Who are you? First and foremost, 1 John 3 and 12 says, you are children of God. I don't know what the enemy might have told you about your identity, but recognize today, you are a child of God. You are a child of God. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. See, today I'm here to remind someone, you are God's very own possession. And through you, he wants to use you for others to have some watch this moments through you. He wants to show others the goodness of God through you. He called you out of this darkness into his marvelous light. Don't let your identity be stolen by the enemy. Don't lose your effectiveness in the kingdom of God. Your identity matters. What you do flows from who you are. Don't lose your identity. We could stand in this place today. Perhaps today there's someone here saying, I don't even know if I am a child of God. I don't know if my identity is secure in Christ. Maybe you have some things in your life that have stopped you from living for God like you should. Maybe the enemy has lied to you, told you you were unworthy of the love of God. Maybe he has said you have no worth, you can't make a difference in the kingdom of God. But Ephesians 4 tells us, throw off our old sinful nature in our former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception instead let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes put on your new stature created to be like God truly righteous and holy I'm here to tell someone you, be, you can become a new person in Christ your identity can be secure here today you can put on a new identity and know that you are a child of God Listen to me, I don't know who I'm reaching for, but Galatians tells us, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. You can put on a new identity here today by uniting yourself with Christ in baptism. You can put on the name of Jesus and your identity will be changed forever. I don't care what the society tells you, what the world tells you, what the enemy tells you. Today, Jesus can make you new. Jesus can make your identity secure. You can become a child of God and begin walking in effectiveness for the rest of your life. Today that can happen. Right now for the whole church, these altars are open. I wonder if we would gather towards the front. I believe God wants to do something in his people today. I believe he wants to bring a renewing to somebody right now. I believe he wants to bring a sureness to someone right now. I believe that there's someone here today that may be struggling with some things and, and the enemy has lied to you. The enemy has tried to tell you your identity is something else. The enemy has tried to attack your identity and say you're worthless, but God is saying, no, you're not. I love you. You are a child of God and I am here for you and 
I wonder right now if, if maybe in this room we can lift our hands. I believe God wants to start ministering to some people. If you need help, we're here to pray for you. If, if you have a need, we're here to pray for you. But if you'll lift your hands right now, I want to pray for everyone in this building, everyone under the sound of my voice online right now. Lift your hands up towards heaven. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, you see every single hand raised. You see every single voice, every single thought that is connected to you right now, God. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bring strength into this place, that you will bring an anointing into this place, that you will show people the goodness of God. Show them, Lord God, who they are in Christ. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let your glory fall in this place right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you could download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.